Hello, and welcome to Decision Points, the U.S.-Israel relationship, the story of key moments in the history of ties between these two countries. My name is David Murkowski, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute and Director of the Project on Arab-Israel Relations, and I'm excited to go on this journey through history with you. In today's episode, we will discuss the role of the United States in the mass immigrations of Soviet Jewry, Ethiopian Jewry, and Syrian Jewry to Israel. These waves of immigration relate to Israel's existence as a haven for Jews around the world facing persecution. The impact has been massive. Jewish immigration at the end of the Cold War, say between 1989 and 1992, added over a million people to Israel's small population. The engineering background of many of the immigrants triggered the high-tech boom that has catapulted Israel economically today. A bit of background. After the Holocaust, there were an estimated 3 million Jews living in the Soviet Union. Under the leadership of Joseph Stalin, especially during his last five years, they experienced extreme anti-Semitism and violence. Jews were recognized as a unique national group in the Soviet Union. The same status conferred to Georgians and Ukrainians, among others, but they were viewed with suspicion, in part due to the fact that they were the only national group whose population resided mostly outside of the USSR. The Israeli victory in the 1967 war triggered a wave of pride among Soviet Jews and led to a resurgent Jewish identity that had been dormant since the 1917 Russian Revolution. Jews sought exit visas to leave the Soviet Union, but were denied. These Jews were therefore called refuseniks. For the Soviet regime, people clamoring to leave, well, this was a point of shame. Some were even arrested for their desire to emigrate. The refuseniks and state-sponsored anti-Semitism sparked outrage among American and Israeli Jews. In the early 1970s, the U.S. and Soviets began reducing Cold War tensions, and this was called detente. American Jews organized advocacy groups and rallies to deal with the oppression of Soviet Jews, insisting that this human rights issue be part of the equation to improve ties between the superpowers. These advocacy movements pressured for the Jackson-Vanik Amendment to trade in 1974. This amendment denied most favored nations' status to non-market countries that restricted emigration, mostly in the Soviet bloc. The amendment passed both the House and the Senate unanimously and was signed into law by U.S. President Gerald Ford. By the late 1970s, a generational shift was occurring in the Soviet Union. A new leader emerged by the mid-'80s. His name, Mikhail Gorbachev, who pledged economic reform and greater openness. Let's see not five or six or ten or twenty refuseniks released at a time, but tens of thousands hundreds of thousands, all those who want to go. Mr. Gorbachev, let these people go. Let them go. Let them go. In this context, the Soviet Union began to give in to economic pressures, like the Jackson-Vanik Amendment, and grant exit visas. Jews and groups of refuseniks immigrated to Israel in large numbers, as the Cold War was now ending and the Soviet Union was collapsing. What people thought might be a trickle became a mighty stream. Another Jewish community, cut off from world Jewry for centuries, was facing trouble and famine-stricken in war-torn Ethiopia. With Israel's covert help and quiet U.S. assistance, these Ethiopian Jews, known as the Falashas, began to migrate to refugee camps in Sudan. They had heard that there were secret airlifts to Israel from these camps, despite Sudan being a member of the Arab League. Between November 1984 and January 1985, Israel conducted Operation Moses. This operation consisted of around 30 flights over seven weeks, which took approximately 8,000 Ethiopian Jews from Sudanese camps to Israel. After news of these flights leaked, they stopped, leaving close to 1,000 Ethiopian Jews in refugee camps. The United States, which maintained a close relationship with Sudanese President Nameri, pushed to evacuate the remaining Jews. They conditioned economic aid to Sudan on their allowing a secret one-shot mission. 
On March 29, 1985, Operation Joshua, also known as Operation Sheba, took place. U.S. Air Force Hercules C-130 planes flew the Jews to a lot. Along with Operation Solomon in 1991 of 14,000 more immigrants, these operations brought thousands to Israel. The U.S. was also instrumental in the emigration of Jews from Syria. In the wake of the landmark 1991 Madrid-Middle East Peace Conference, which brought Arabs and Israelis together for the first time, George H.W. Bush's administration persuaded the Syrians to open the gates for 5,000 Syrian Jews who wanted to immigrate to Israel and the United States. Our guests today are Natan Sharansky and Malcolm Honline. Natan Sharansky became the embodiment of the Soviet Jewry movement in the 1970s and 80s. He's a unique figure involved in a dissident community that wanted to challenge the Soviet regime from within as well. The iconic words at his trial next year in Jerusalem captured people around the world and placed Natan Sharansky on the cover of Time magazine. He spent nine years in the Soviet Gulag. In 1986, he was released after international advocacy and pressure by both President Jimmy Carter and subsequently U.S. President Ronald Reagan. Sharansky immigrated to Israel after his release and served as a cabinet member in successive Israeli governments. He recently completed serving nine years as the chairman of the Jewish Agency, the Israeli organization that links Jewish communities around the world. Malcolm Honlein has been a dominant figure in American Jewish organizational life for decades. He recently completed 32 years as the executive vice chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations and also headed the New York Conference for Soviet Jews. He has been a key figure in seeking to win U.S. governmental support for persecuted Jewish communities. Natan, thanks for joining us from Jerusalem. And Malcolm, thanks for joining us from New York. All right, so let's begin with a key turning point in the 1970s. The Jackson-Vanik Amendment was viewed by the Soviet Jews inside the Soviet Union as a lifesaver. Is that correct, Natan? Well, I would say that the pressure by of the world jury and specifically by uh, the administration of the United States of America, we all understood that as a critical question because it was clear that Soviet Union will not start giving visas to Soviet citizens without very strong pressure. But it's not psychological pressure. It has to be very important things for Soviet Union, and economical pressure was the key. Jackson Amendment, jackson Vanek Amendment, gave us hope that that's something that threatens to Soviet Union enough in order that will, they will take our demands seriously. Okay, and Malcolm, the jackson Vanek Amendment was more challenging inside the U.S., because you wanted to balance Jewish emigration, and yet the Jewish community did not want to be viewed as an impediment to the new detente that was just beginning in the Nixon-Kissinger period. So how did, does the United States and how does the American Jewish community balance between these two impulses? Well, having been in the fulcrum of that, having worked with Senator Jackson and Richard Pearl to get the jackson Vanek Amendment adopted, against often opposition from within the community, as you indicated, and it was turned down initially by the National Conference on Soviet Jury, although adopted by the New York Conference on Soviet Jury, with which I was associated. And it had to do with, with a variety of factors. It was strong opposition from President Nixon and Secretary of State Kissinger and others on a variety of grounds. I think that there were a number of contributing factors that led up to it, the 67 more, the awakening of Russian Jews, the hijacking, the creations of the National and New York Conferences, the creation of a movement in America that drew you know, hundreds of thousands of people to Fifth Avenue and to demonstrations across the country. All of these contributed to the a change in the climate and determination. Some would also say Ghana play a role, at least in, in gaining the attention. So Jackson Vanek came within a changing climate and eventually garnered the support across the board of the Jewish community, recognizing that um, this was our obligation, that if never again was to mean something, this was the test, what we did and would do for Soviet Jewry. And I would say that there was no limit to what people were prepared to sacrifice personally and collectively as a community in order to gain the freedom of Russian Jews. Jackson Vanek became the flagship endeavor and its passage and adoption certainly created a leverage 
and the support of Congress, which was both bipartisan and across the board, as well as of local officials and others, created a dynamic movement that was unique, I think, in American Jewish history. By the way, just in terms of an anecdote, was there any moment that you felt Malcolm uh, dealing with Nixon and Kissinger, which they clearly opposed this, as, as you pointed out, where the Jewish community was able to confront some of their fears? What moment do they reconcile that the votes are heading in a certain direction? I'm not sure that they ever really reconciled to it. They opposed it uh, throughout and on various grounds. I, I don't question the, the motive, but the actions. And when we had demonstrations when President Nixon came to New York and other events, it became uh, very critical. And they enlisted people, leaders in the community to object and to try to stop some of these manifestations. It did not work. I think it backfired on them. And you had real changes. And one of the changes was uh, Secretary Schultz, who was so devoted and did so many remarkable things, including uh, having a Pesach Seder in the, the embassy of the United States in Moscow, his famous stories with Edith Nudel, et cetera, his outspokenness on this. There were others as well who really played heroic roles in this. It is remarkable that you had this grassroots movement that had Solidarity Sundays in New York and in other cities. There were all these rallies. But the human rights issue of Soviet Jews became part of the superpower equation. It was all part of a bigger picture in a certain way. You were you were advocating against the Soviets, but you were also advocating to the, the United States to make it part of that equation. That's absolutely true. It became the number one human rights cause. It drew the, the support of people from every sector and built coalitions involving every sector of American society, religious, ethnic, racial joined in this uh, effort. It, it was probably the purest movement. And a lot of it had to do with the, the courage of Russian Jews that inspired us because, you know, they put their lives on the line and the American Jews then responded to that and non-Jews responded to it. It became a vehicle not as an anti-communist or anti-Russian. We tried always not to have that um, color to the movement. It was a pure human rights and demand the freedom, let them live as Jews in Russia, or let them leave. And that balance was critical to building these broad coalitions. And so, Natan, back to you. You embody the Soviet Jewry movement. You mentioned how the Six-Day War, you know, inspired people. So can you say a little bit more about that, about how this awakening of Soviet Jews occurred inside the Soviet Union out of the blue and how it erupted? Very important to understand that I think nothing could happen without Israel. We were absolutely assimilated Soviet Jews, disconnected from everything. There was nothing Jewish in our life except from anti-Semitism. And suddenly, after six-day war, suddenly you see how all the world looks on us, our enemies and our friends, and say how you Jews did it. And you understand whether you want or not, Jews are connected to Israel. And that's practically in the underground. We started reading the books, the books which were brought, by the way, by American Jewish tourists, about ourselves, about our history, about Israel, about uh, the creation of the state of Israel. And suddenly you realize that with some twist in your mind, you can be part of this great history, of this great nation, and of this great state. And by the way, in addition to this feeling that you want to be connected to this great state, here are American Jews who are coming as a tourist, and they say to you, oh, you are, your father is from Odessa, and my father is from Odessa. We are family. We want to help you. Suddenly you realize that it's all one big family of Jews from all over the world who want to help you. And that's what I think gave strength for us, first of all, to go back to our roots, then to have enough strength to start speaking about and fighting for our right to live and to leave. And you who, you know, who faced nine years in Siberia and the Gulag, of course, you didn't know how long you were going to be there, but you inspired people around the world at your trial when you said next year in Jerusalem. And I just wondered about what do you feel gave you the, the inner strength to stand up to the whole Soviet empire? First of all, before I stood in front of the trial, I was for a number of years activist and, in fact, spokesman of Soviet Jewry movement and human rights movement of the Soviet Union. So I met with hundreds, American Jews and Jews from all over the world, 
who were coming as tourists, but in fact were connecting us to world Jewry, and they saw how passionate they are. So even being for one and a half year under interrogations, I was absolutely sure that the Jewish world keeps fighting for us, doesn't stop it for a day. So that definitely was a source of strength. The other source was that you discovered your Jewish history and you want to be part of it, and you understand that your struggle, your the position which you'll take on the trial can have influence on thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Jews of the world, and you don't want to weaken them. And the last, but not the least, I say to everybody, before you go to prison, you have to get married as I did. And I was absolutely sure that my wife, Abital, who left for Israel day after our hoopah, continued struggle and will do its best. So relying on my wife, on my state, and on my Jewish people, that what was giving me the strength. There's no doubt Avital was the secret weapon here. Also, Natan, I mean, and you mentioned also the dissident movement. Malcolm has mentioned it. And you were a unique figure because you were both a leader in the Soviet Jewry movement. You worked with Andrei Sakharov in the dissident movement, the leading uh, Soviet physicist. And you posed a particular challenge, even for Israel, that wanted to make the distinction that Malcolm just spoke about, that you were not out to oppose the Soviet regime, but to just to be able to either live or leave. Do you feel that you dealt with that unique challenge and and the fact that there may be the establishment Jewish organizations and the state of Israel were not necessarily see things the way you saw things? Yeah, well, though, as I said, Israel was absolute instrumental, central point in our struggle. On the other hand, because Israel was putting so much effort in the struggle, it also felt to some extent that this struggle belongs to Israel. As a result, I had a number of problems. First of all, they wanted to dictate us whether to have a quiet diplomacy or public diplomacy, whether to have demonstrations or not, and we, we thought we can decide for ourselves. Second, Israel authorities didn't like the fact that some of the Jews who applied for Israel then decided to go to America. They were irritated by the fact that people like me were insisting that freedom of choice should be inseparable from Zionism and people should be let to go wherever they want to go. And the third and the most important conflict which I had at some moment with the Israeli authorities was that I became, well, I felt that as a part of my new accepted freedom, as part of the fact that I became proud Jew, I have also freedom to express my opinions about the other people who suffer. And that's how I became very involved with my friends, the dissidents, and was working with Andrei Sakharov. And uh, Israel authorities were afraid that that's something which will irritate KGB so much that it will endanger all the Zionist movement. At the same time, I felt it very strongly that the fact that I cooperated closely with people like Andrei Sakharov and the Jewish organization always asked me to get but on, on record, his support, his letters of support, for example, to Jackson Amendment, to support prisons of Zion, I felt that it's our mutual benefit, that uh, I express solidarity with people like Sakharov, and, and at the same time we are getting support of the many people who are fighting for human rights and uh, who want to hear the voice of people like Sakharov. So I w- was of a very different opinion and than Israel authorities, and it's brought to a number of very serious conflicts with them before my arrest. A key moment uh, for American Jews was that March on Washington in December 1987 during Gorbachev's first U.S. visit. And indeed, Natan, you inspired people from all over the country to come for this event, and the organized Jewish community went into high gear, and over a quarter million people answered your call. So, I would like to ask this to both of you. Uh, Natan, if you want to begin, and Malcolm, I want to hear what you have to say. It just seemed like this was a unifying moment for American Jews. And in an era of polarization that we're in now, does American Jews, do they miss this sense of a unifying call, the way that March in Washington represented, and indeed the whole Soviet Jewry movement represented? It's true that in the last weeks before Gorbachev came, Jewish establishment, organized Jewish community demonstrated unbelievable energy and uh, talent in organizing this demonstration, and it was a great achievement. But 
year and a half before when I started speaking that the day Gorbachev comes, there has have to be hundreds of thousands of American Jews in Washington. I have to say there were big reservations, many two types of reservations. First of all, the leaders of establishment organizations were saying there is no way to bring in winter to Washington hundreds of thousands of Jews. As the specialists from National Conference for Soviet Jewry told, maximum 18, 1, 8,000, that's the maximum Jews that can be brought in winter to Washington. And the second reservation was more ideological, that when finally there is no new detente, everybody loves Gorbachev, we Jews cannot be those who are like warmongers, who are organizing demonstrations against uh, Gorbachev. I have to say that when I started simply traveling all over America, it was so clear that everybody wants this demonstration, that students, I was speaking on dozens of universities, they all were saying only, tell us the time and we'll come. And so it was very good to see that the enthusiasm of grassroots was much bigger and it overcome simply all the reservations and all the fears of establishment. And that's why when finally the decision was made, I don't think there was one stone that establishment did turn over to organize this demonstration. And I have to say, yeah, really, in the end, it was solidarity of all parts of American society and all parts of American Jewry. Everybody was there. Nathan, there's a great story you tell about being in the Gulag where I think they showed you a video of people demonstrating for you and they dismissed it as just housewives and students. That's true, but I have to upset you guys. I did see the clip of the video, but that was demonstration in London. But it also was very good Jewish demonstration in front of Soviet embassy uh, with my wife leading it. And they said, the head of KGB and interrogation team told me, what, you think they will help you? Look who you, they are. They're only a bunch of students and housewives, and we are KGB. I think this KGB colonel gave the great definition to our movement. The army of students and housewives defeated the army of KGB. And you said at that first speech when I was with you at the World Union Jewish Students, you said to the KGB then, if I'm right, you said, if I reach the housewives and the students, that shows it's a real grassroots movement, correct? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And uh, then I traveled all over the world to thank students and housewives. That this unbelievable army of Jewish people which defeated the most powerful dictatorship in the world. As a result, the Iron Curtain fell. Soviet Union fell apart, millions of Jews got their freedom, and all the world became more free place. That is the power of Jewish students and housewives. Exactly. And Malcolm, to you now, which is, do you miss this in an era of polarization? As someone who has devoted decades of service to the American Jewish community, to Jews around the world, do you miss this unifying cause that rallies everyone in the way that the Soviet Jewry movement did? I miss the unifying aspects of it, and I do think that the Soviet Jewry unified people, and especially the American Jewish community, in a unique way. I do want to add a couple of comments. One is that Israel was indeed central, not just to the movement around the world, but to the United States. It was Israel's inspiration involvement that really helped make the Soviet Jewry movement here. I can give many examples, but in particular, sending people into Russia. I was one of those who went in the early 70s and got arrested there, that it was uh, Israel that organized and made these trips uh, possible. And on the issue of the separation between those dissident movements, I mean, there was a logic to it about uh, that the Soviet Jewry movement was not against Russia. It was, it was for repatriation to the homeland, which was consistent with Russian law and that the other movements were seen as opposed to the regime and to the government, that it would jeopardize the ability to get Russian Jews out. And you can debate this uh, issue. It was debated then and certainly still probably the subject of some differences, but there was a logic to the position. And there were other things that came up also about how during the course of the movement, about how it could be most effective and mobilized in the most constructive way. But, you know, unity is the one precondition to every great thing that has ever happened to the Jewish people. It's the only thing that the, God demands of us from the, when we stood at Sinai, Kisha Chad Belebechad, as one people with one heart, to the rescue of Russian Jews, Ethiopian Jews, Yemeni Jews. When Jews are united, others will join us. When Jews stood up, 
the Jews in Russia and the Jews in America responded. Others rallied to the flag. If we're not there and if we weren't in the forefront, these things would have become like all of the other important human rights causes in the world, which are neglected. So it's a core message to us that we learned from it. And there were people, as Natan alluded, who devoted their whole lives. I know people who lost their jobs because they were giving so much time to the Soviet Jewry movement. When Avital came, it inspired people. Others who came, they motivated and mobilized American Jews and in a way that had never happened before in American Jewish history. And I think we have to credit leaders in the American government who were responsive, who took this cause on, and who were supportive as the Jews came out and in pressuring to get them out. I'll just add one word about Israel, too. I mean, the obvious needs to be stated, which is that Israel did the heavy lift, so to speak, in actually physically absorbing these over one million Jews from the Soviet Union. Maybe people didn't believe it was possible, although Ben Gurion, I found uh, in writing this book uh, with Dennis about his uh, session with uh, de Gaulle, where he said in 1960 in 30 years, the Soviet Union will disappear and the Jews will come from the Soviet Union. It is remarkable, though, that they came, Israel absorbed them, and they in return have been like rocket fuel for the state of Israel, the whole high tech startup nation Israel. A lot of these people are been engineers from the former Soviet Union. So it has been a a symbiotic relationship. Let me just ask one or two points to either of you on something that people don't know as much, which is the Ethiopian Jewry movement and the Syrian Jewry movement. When you do a deep dive, you see that the United States did play a role in pressuring Sudan to allow the Jews out in Operation Moses. And then of those 8,000 or so that got out then, there was uh, still 500 that were stuck because of the media leak. And then uh, the U.S. orders like a Hercules C-130 to pick up those that were still left behind. And then there was another 14,000 that come out, not 84 or 85, but in, in 1991 in Operation Solomon. And here, too, the State Department, the key people are involved in these 14,000 who get out. I found the letter that Bush wrote to Yitzhak Shamir, George H.W. Bush, who was very much involved on the Sudan thing and getting the Ethiopian Jews out, making sure that the Jews of Syria could get out after the Madrid Peace Conference. So there is like a hidden role that the U.S. plays, always working with Israel in this regard, not alone, but they were a good team, so to speak. Malcolm, is there anything you, you would like to give us a little behind the scenes on that? There's a lot behind the scenes, and maybe one day if I get to write the book, I will tell the true story of what happened. But in regard to Ethiopian Jews and the second operation, if you remember, there was word that there would be a 48-hour window of opportunity. And I went to see General Scowcroft, who was chief of staff of President Bush, and asked him to enable Senator Bashawitz to go to Ethiopia to negotiate, to gain the opportunity to get the Jews out during that one moment, unique opportunity. And frankly, he turned me down initially. And while we were talking, he got summoned to the president. And I told the people with us to stay seated and just asked him as he walked out, asked the president if he can afford to have pictures of dead Ethiopian Jews, like the pictures of Iraq that was in the paper of the dead Iraqis that morning. And he looked at me in shock and went out and came back and said, the president said, okay. And literally that weekend, Bashawitz was there and that opened the opportunity. But the U.S. government then joined wholeheartedly in the support, and the efforts that were made were really remarkable. And, uh, of course, again, it comes back to the point that you have a state of Israel and an Israeli Air Force and all the capacities that a state has that help make it possible. And the same thing was true regarding uh, Syrian jury. Shoshana Cardin and I went to see the president, and they told us to come back December 6th. Whatever, they won't go into the details. But the bottom line was that when we reminded them, they got active. Again, when you think of all the issues around the world, for the United States to take a lead in each of these cases and to be helpful in in regard to Iranian Jews, they were in regard to Yemeni Jews, regard to Ethiopian Jews, Iraqi Jews, all of the Jews that we have tried to help over the years. The United States government, it's remarkable. There are people, hundreds of millions of people who during this time were refugees, were subjugated to all kinds of discriminatory practices. And yet America stood up when it counted, and it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always so smooth. If you remember after the Russian Jews came out, the fight between Shamir and Bush over loan guarantees, there were tense moments in the process. But overall, I think we have a lot to be grateful to the United States for 
the efforts that the various administrations have made. Nathan, is there anything you want to add to that? I'm really ex- even excited while Malcolm is telling what was behind the scene because I happened to participate as a volunteer in Operation Shlomo, Solomon. I was in one of those airplanes which landed in Addis, and every 20, 30 minutes there was another airplane for 200 seats, 400 people are coming to the airplane and flying 14,000 people were taken during one day, one night, in fact. And what was amazing to see how the ceasefire worked. The soldiers are standing around the airport and Israelis from Mossad and Jewish agency are taking 100 of Ethiopian Jews after the other, taking them. And it's like biblical picture that children of five years old are keeping children of two years old. And every family is connected with the rope in order not to lose one another. And in this ceasefire, absolute silence, that living and living and living, and then the moment operation is finished, the war resumes. Of course, we knew that American presence behind all this. And what is also interesting, how America and the American president were modest about it. Later, when I met Bush's son, and I told him about unique contribution of his father to the struggle of Soviet Jews and Ethiopian Jews, he said, you know, he never tell, told us about it. I said, well, probably it was a secret. But we did know. We did know and we did appreciate. When the Bush father started helping to, when he was also already the head of CIA, and then he was involved in some operations in Sudan. And uh, not speaking about unique contribution of President Reagan, of course, for the struggle for Soviet Jewry. So American administrations, all of them, beginning, by the way, from Carter, with all our criticism about Carter, he is the one who put the problem of human rights and Soviet Jewry as a part of official policy. So the contribution of American administration was the most important, I would say, after the fact of the existence of the State of Israel. It is remarkable, again, in this era of polarization, that this issue of Soviet Jews, Ethiopian Jews, Syrian Jews wasn't just a unifier within the American Jewish community, but it was a bipartisan issue in the United States Congress. At the time that people could have different, complicated relations to Israel, and as you point out, both Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush had difficult relations with the governments at the time. At the same time, they understood, each of them, their unique role to play in helping a persecuted community. In terms of Carter, it was during the detente period, and this was part of that equation. And during H. W. Bush, it was at the end of the Cold War when there was a world in flux and it could go in different directions. Even in the Ethiopian case, Mengistu Haile Miriam was the leader of Ethiopia and his reign was slipping away. And there was a sense of urgency to get the Jews out because who knew who would follow him? So there was a lot of drama behind the scenes, but it is an inspiring lesson for all of us, it seems to me, that if people from all different stripes could come together then, Maybe there's a way to get this kind of bipartisan and broad support once again for some key issues today. So I think it's very important that both of you were able to join us here and talk about a key moment in the U.S. Israel relationship, which is often forgotten, but it was a great partnership between the U.S. and Israel in saving countless lives and making the relationship between Israel and its diaspora stronger. And it's a lesson that will never be forgotten. And I'm just so grateful to both of you for making it so vivid and alive for our listeners today. So I want to thank you both very, very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. It was wonderful to hear Natan and Malcolm. It was very meaningful to me because I was the head of the World Union of Jewish Students in the 1980s, and uh, before that active in the Soviet Jewry movement at Columbia University in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. And Nata Transky was a, a source of inspiration, not just as, as a symbol in the gulag, but really as a leader when he emerges. I was very touched when he said, I want my first speech to be before students because the students were with me all over the world. It's an episode that might seem like coming from Mars to a young generation that wasn't born in those days, but it's a chapter certainly worth recalling. So thank you all for being with us. Thank you all very much for listening. 
I would urge you also to look at the book that Dennis Ross and I wrote called Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. A lot of declassified material coming both from State Department archives and the archives of Israel. Please go to your favorite podcast app, subscribe, rate, and review, and tell your friends. I want to thank all of those who made this podcast possible. Basha Rosenbaum, Richard Myron, and Anouk Millet of Earshot Strategies. Paul Woody Woodhull of District Productive on Capitol Hill, Scott Boxer, Rena Wasserstein, and David Patkin.